I'd like to thank my good friend and colleague Ben Furnish and all the great mechanical engineers that he works with over there in Irwin, Pennsylvania for teaching me about the ways to mitigate risk when sizing, selecting, and designing mechanics. I have a question for you. What's more important to you, your time or your money? Or how about the question, what's more important to your company, your time or your money? Is it your time, your money, or both? Could be, of course, the answer. But I ask customers this question all the time because it really depends upon the, the business model. Are they designing just one? Are they designing a hundred or a thousand? It, are they wanting to design the inexpensive stuff that they have to spend a lot of engineering time to design in? Or do they want the more expensive stuff that is going to minimize the amount of their engineering time? It really just depends upon their priorities. So I asked that question. I'm curious as to how you answer this poll up here. If you like what we're talking about today, follow my hashtag motion control show and check out my website. So we're talking about mitigating risks when selecting mechanics. There are a couple of different areas, uh, support, ownership, technology, specification, and connectivity that we can consider. We're going to be talking about the risks, the ownership, who has the liability, who supports failures, who responds to the customer's needs, the technology implications, when to select which technology, technology strengths, how to cost, uh, how to balance the cost versus performance. Specifications, which we've been talking a lot about, but how do I understand the various marketing speak of manufacturers and how do the specifications affect application performance? The connectivity, will the parts mount with minimal effort? Will communication between electronics be seamless? And the ease of setup. Support, is there a local contact wherever your machine ships to support it? Will the on-time delivery hold your project up? And when you call, do you get answers? So those are basically the topics we're gonna to be talking about. Make or buy, pros and cons. Let's talk about the make, make your own mechanics, the pros. You can design it exactly the way that you want to, and you can design it with a particular cost-effective scenario, a high volume. The cons are the functional and the life testing of the design and managing the development efforts. You have to manage it. It's going to consume your engineering resources. And the testing, the inventory, and many times the total cost of ownership is higher than buying it. Okay, how about buying it? Well, the pros are you're reducing your functionality risk. You have a proven warranty. It's more modular. And there's a known and fixed product cost, and typically that less than the in-house design. On the cons, though, you're typically buying features not needed. And the size may be slightly outside what you're looking for. And then you have to worry about somebody else having control of the product obsolescence. There's some ways to mitigate risks if you're making it yourself. You can use the failure mode and effect analysis tool. We'll show that on the next slide. And you need to perform the design for manufacturability reviews. And you bring your teams together and be able to go through all that. Life cycle testing. Uh, you can verify the manufacturing of the tolerances and the fits. And then you need to run alpha units to verify the performance. Here's a sample FMEA form you can check out. There are ways to mitigate risk if you're buying a product. And you can request the product's lead time and its on-time delivery percentage. You can ask whether the supplier can prov uh, provide the validation of specifications like laser interferometers and torque graphs. You can ask what the product's PPM or the parts per million of products that are returned for problems may not be available for a few years if it's a new product. And what's the typical the life cycle of the products that you're buying? Here are some technology implications, selecting the right components, uh, which is important if you're making or buying. Uh, learn the technology basics, the pros and cons of each of the products that you're using in it, and use the right technology. Learn the detailed specifications of the technology to be able to determine their performance. You have to learn a lot if you're making it from a component level. For instance, here's a number of different uh, linear drivetrains for changing rotary motion to linear. And then there's different components if you're doing a direct drive linear drivetrains, like linear motors, piezo, are a couple examples. Then there's the linear bearing technologies, 
and there's linear feedback technologies. You have to pick the pros and cons or pick from the different pros and cons of all these different technologies. Understanding component or product specifications is the key to, un to determining your application performance. However, the standards are lacking on many of the technologies and products. Specsmanship. Now, we talked about specsmanship in a previous episode. It really comes down to the life of the product and the mechanical life of the product, the bearing life curves if you're talking bearings, for, for instance. Uh, the in-depth detail understanding of the components and products is needed to make an informed decision. And remember that the system level or multi-axis performance is not the same as the component specifications. When you bring a bunch of components together, you can't necessarily rely on just the component specifications. Linear positioning products define the accuracy in one of two ways. One is based on the accuracy of the drive components and the other one is based on the accuracy of the position or assembly with a fixed point of measurement. The point of measurement is usually centered uh, left to right and 35 millimeters above the mounting surface. But neither method tells the whole story. The component specification is the least representative, but neither method takes into account the point of measurement of your application. So to determine the accuracy of the position or at your point of measurement, you need to know your POM as well as the angular errors of the positioner and some trigonometry. There's the pitch, there's the roll, and there's the yaw. And when translated to the point of measurement, they affect the positional accuracy. Let's take a look at an example. With the load mounted centered above the bearings, the primary error contributor is pitch, which will affect the accuracy in the x direction. As it pitches, it's going to cause an angle, some angular error there. With the load mounted off to the side of the bearings, the primary error contributing factors are yaw and roll. Yaw will cause the error in the x direction, and roll will cause it in the z direction. So remember, as it shifts, you're going to get some angular error in different directions. The point of measurement accuracy is complicated to calculate because the angular errors vary from position of positioner to positioner. The angular errors are not linear errors and are normally estimated, so you, it, they're very difficult to measure over the course of travel. Determining multi-axis accuracy is much more complex. I've tried to do this. I've taken multiple axes, uh, given the specifications, repeatability, and accuracy of different uh, actuators and put them together in X, Y, and Z uh, configurations. And you have to take into account bearing deflection and the deflection of the, uh, the actuator itself. And it gets to be very complex. How you should mitigate risk is find ways in your process to use the repeatability of the system instead of the accuracy. That goes back to a previous episode. Mapping the process works really well and work with a professional motion supplier when you can. Understanding specifications of product performance is a key to a successful application. Knowing everything about all the technologies is not possible, so just recognize you need help. Work closely with the manufacturers, get training, and work with companies that have expertise in system-based solutions. We really want to know what's going on. Now let's talk about the interconnectivity between the mechanical components, the tolerance levels, the repeatable mounting. You can use dowel pins. You have to know about the X, Y orthogonality. Uh, you might have to worry about the misalignment, which causes premature failure, whether from the motor to the screw, or the screw to the bearings, or the brake to the screw. And then you might wonder whether it's field repair repairable, whether or not it's easily assembled and disassembled in the field, uh, whether it's the brakes, the parallel motor mounts, the motor replacement. You might want to know about the electrical components. Remember in a previous episode, I talked about uh, looking holistically at the system. Don't just look at the components and make decisions. You want to look at the holistic uh, approach to the system. So you have to worry about the electrical components even though you're just looking at the mechanics. So you might want to worry about the motor feedback to drive. And you might want to worry about the single frequency, and the quality, and the noise and bandwidth. Uh, you might want to worry about the drive to controller communications, whether it's the motion bus or a communication speed. This goes back to the electrical noise uh, uh, presentations I made back in episodes 9, 10, and 11. 
how to mitigate some of these problems. Uh, well, approval drawings, minimize supplier variety, single source where possible, and partner with a local motion expert, people who know motion and know about these problems. Some questions to ask. If a machine goes down, can a supplier support your needs locally, nationally, globally? How about what type of technical support is available, different time zones and overseas? And does your motion supplier understand the complete motion system? I get calls all the time for motors that are making noises, and so there's something wrong with the motor. Well, it turns out that there's something wrong in the programming. Uh, it's the software because it's the tuning. Or it, someone might think that it's a problem with the mechanics where it's actually a problem in the controller or vice versa. So you have to look at the whole system when you're troubleshooting. Do you have that expertise or are you working with somebody who does? Some tips on mitigating the risk. Partner with a name brand company. You pay for what you get. Most people don't believe this, but I've seen it time and time again where people try to cheap out and then they end up paying more in the support and the problems that happen down the road. Ask for references. Ask for people that you know that have worked with companies and see if they've been pleased or not. Develop relationships with specific people. That, then you learn how to trust them and trust their knowledge and what they can and can't do. So in summary, risk to consider. Ownership, technology implications, specifications, connectivity, and support. I'm Corey Foster of Valen Corporation. Follow my hashtag motion control show. Check out this website. There's a lot of good material in the episodes previous to this that I referred to. There's more coming down the road. I hope you learned something.